I first noticed or was introduced to Chinese characters by my parents and I was so thrilled to see that there was a language which was written almost in pictures or signs which was not like our language because I couldn't spell and they gave me a small book on teach yourself Chinese. I don't think somebody aged 10 can really learn to teach themselves Chinese from this little book but I started to copy the Chinese characters into a notebook when I was that sort of age. I really wanted to study Chinese and study Chinese objects. So I applied to the British Museum and fortunately I was able to get appointed. So I went to the British Museum in 1968. And they sent me to SOAS and at SOAS I took a degree in Chinese language and literature and I'm incredibly grateful that the teachers were very strong-minded. I visited China a lot, starting in 1975 was my first visit, and until 2019 I visited every year, and in my late time, after I retired from being warden in 2010, I probably visited China three times every year to, from 2010 to 2019. And that was my most intensive research period for my new book. And what struck me was how enormously different, um, particularly buildings like the Forbidden City were, because we have these stone buildings which have a narrow front and a long back like a church, and you have these horizontal buildings on platforms built of wood. So my first memories from that trip are really from walking around the Forbidden City very early in the morning, two or three times, without anybody else. The whole of that journey remains for me one of my big experiences because we travelled to Xi'an, then we went south to Suzhou, Shanghai and then to Guangzhou. So that was a big trip for someone who had never been to China and I began to understand the geography then. And I think the one thing that's unusual about me is not really that I've been over 40 years but that I've been to so many different places and appreciate the geography and the climate and the different crops, the different lifestyles. I mean, people who live in Inner Mongolia are not like living the way people live in Guizhou. So I would say one thing that Western audience lacks is an understanding of the size of China, the different range of lifestyles, the different people, and the different levels of wealth and poverty. So the most dramatic items were the bronzes from San Xingdue, where there are now real new discoveries. And everybody realized that this was contemporary with the Shang dynasty, but clearly not part of the Shang dynasty state even, something completely different. You can see from the material that they have beliefs and ways of life and practices that are very clearly based on their own regions and have nothing to do indeed with other parts of China at that moment. So you're a huge country, it's not surprising that it starts off with different regions with different strengths and different ideas. So this new book is about tombs and the tombs would make no sense if we didn't think that the ancestors were important to their descendants. I think what Chan people need to understand, if they can, is that the, there are many different regions and the regions have different histories, different customs and even today quite different food and almost different dialects. So that's one thing. And the other is what I started to think about most when writing this book is that China has a different social system from the West, that in China in all the world, families are very important, but in China the major unit of the society is the family. It can be a very large family, we would call it a clan, or with many branches and many married sons and daughters, or it can be nowadays quite a narrow one. But in any case, the most important thing is it's hierarchical. So. If you're a son, you can't replace your father. You can't take his position. So the hierarchy is unchangeable. And so China has a much stronger attachment to hierarchy than the West. It's much more dramatic in these ancient periods, but you have large tombs for the Ming emperors, the Qing emperors, and the belief is that you need to look after your ancestors in order to make sure that you have a reasonable life in the living time. And that I had not 
thought about in such depth without writing this book. And, but I then looked at all these tombs and realized that the people who built the tombs, and I'm talking about the Shang and the Zhou and the Qin and the Han perhaps, they really did want to make a good afterlife for their ancestors. And so it's that which has taught me much more about China. I think what's needed on both sides is more exchange. And I think um, what is important is to understand that in the modern age, we all have to understand each other's differences. More people study China, anthropology, politics particularly, um, modern China, contemporary China, Chinese history, and uh, so there, you know, there weren't any Chinese historians in the 1960s. So um, I, I think it's expanded from being a subject that is quite confined in a language teaching system where classical Chinese is emphasized in both Cambridge and Oxford to covering contemporary China. And there are also people who are scientists from China, the you know, computer scientists, chemists, and so on, who are Chinese nationals or Chinese ethnically, and they're teaching in Western subjects. So um, China has opened up in all sorts of ways. Um, I think one difficulty remains the language. I think the language is a tough barrier. Because it's not easy, but I think both sides have to try.